In this part, I would like to discuss IRT, Item Response Theory, and its application to personal selection. IRT can be seen as a method that helps us to build a good test, let's say a perfect test even. IRT, if applied properly, is a method that helps us to focus on an item. It also can help us to properly focus on a test. Typically, we use unidimensional model. If a test has more dimensions than one, analysis are more complex. Today, I'm going to focus on unidimensional model. As I mentioned, appropriate use of IRT is to focus on items. And reason why is that we focus on items because we want to select good items or improve items if are not good enough. In some cases, we are interested in deleting items because they can be considered as bad items. Specific statistical procedures that are implemented within this approach are a fantastic tool when deciding about the quality of items. We can compare IRT to classical test theory, CTT. Let's consider this comparison. When using IRT, we answer to the question how good a latent variable, a specific trait, personality trait, or cognitive uh, trait or skill is measured. It's related to probability of scoring at a specific level depending on the level of a measured latent variable. It means that we always assume that specific traits or skills are never measured directly. And the error related to this measurement can be random. What is also good about IRT, we can assess item fit, so to what extent a specific item is a good element of the whole test, to what extent it increases validity of a, of a test, and also how well we can decide upon person fit to specific measurement. So to what extent measured characteristics reflect person traits? It's not possible when we apply CTT because we do not have specific coefficients related to fit. Another good element of application of IRT is that we control for guessing factor. As you may assume, and maybe you've experienced that, some people can, to some extent, guess how they should respond to a specific item. So, to some extent, they fake their responses. When using IRT, we can assess this factor, and that's a huge advantage over CTT. And now, let's discuss the fact that when we use IRT, we can assess two types of reliability. Our first type is related to items. And the second type, it takes into account differences between people. So when assessing reliability, we assess differences between items and differences between people. It's not possible to do that with CTT. Later on, when uh, I will be discussing a specific example, you will see better what are the differences between those two types of reliability. Also, when using IRT, 
we can very nicely control for differences between uh, different groups. Female and male, different occupation or different levels of education. Then we use a function called diff, D-I-F. It helps us to control the effects of groups. And with the control for this effect, we can very nicely adapt or select items that are objective measure of specific skills in all groups that are taken into account. So for instance, let's go back again to the problem of globalization. Let's say that you want to construct a test that can be used in different countries, in different populations. Probably you would need to learn IRT as a method that can help you to develop a method that can be used in different countries that could give you a fully equivalent result. For this purpose, IRT is a perfect method. IRT is not an easy procedure to implement. We may use different types of software. We can use commercial one. This one is uh, quite expensive. But also we can use open access R. Or we can also use user-friendly JMetric. It's available for different platforms, Windows or Mac. And today I'm going to show you some examples from JMetric. By using those kind of software, we can assess reliability related to participants and items. We can assess ICC, in this case, item characteristic curve. I will explain in a second what it doesn't mean. We can also assess item information curve, IIC. We can assess specific parameters, a parameter related to discrimination, so uh, differences between separate groups, difficulties, B parameters. We can also assess uh, fit statistics. In this case, for instance, if we would uh, use IoT Pro uh, statistics 0.8 uh, indicate good level. And of course, in those statistics, we could use um, DIF. We could calculate characteristics of and fit depending on a group level. Let's see some examples. The reason why I discuss this is to encourage you to learn those methods. To some extent, the use of those methods go beyond this course. But still, you will see today some examples and later in the course, Dan Asfer, he will show you, based on his effects, how we can utilize IRT for different purposes related to uh, human resources. First of all, if this method is uh, new to you, it's really important to discuss ICC curve. This graph, it shows ICC. This is a curve. And this shape is expected when you analyze a test. Why you would expect that? You would expect that you will be able to identify three specific parameters that are described here. First parameter is parameter A. It shows the extent to which a test discriminates between two specific groups. 
let's say, highly versus slightly skilled individuals. A software calculates this parameter based on the given data. It shows this parameter and its value. To what extent specific item can distinguish between high and low group? That's very useful information because if the test can differentiate between high and low, uh, you can later on make your decisions based on this kind of uh, information, right? Because you want to know which candidates have lower skills and which candidate have sky le higher level of skills. This analysis also shows you difficulty level. So how difficult can be a specific item? And of course, that can, that can be also created for the whole test. So how what's the difficult level of specific item and also what's the difficulty level of the whole test? That's very informative because you may want to have items of different difficulty. Think for a second about adaptive testing that I've uh, described later on. For instance, if you know that adaptive testing it's a method that can be relatively cheap because it can be really fast, but you also know that if you want to implement adaptive testing, probably you would select medium level difficulty item as the first item that is presented to all participants. Because you would assume that if a person has a low level of specific skill, then he or she would respond incorrectly to the medium level of, um, of an item. And then less difficult item would be selected. And again, you need to know this information in order to select, uh, to present uh, an item with lower difficulty and so on. On the other hand, if you would present low, uh, medium level um, item to a highly skilled participant and then he or she would respond correctly, then more difficult uh, item will be presented to her and to him, right? That can be only done if you know what's the difficulty of specific items. What also can read, uh, we can read from this graph is a C parameter. It's a chance of guessing correct response. So if you apply cognitive capacity test, you also want to know how likely is that a person guesses or gives a response without actually knowing what's the correct response. And based on this, you can select bad or good items. You would assume that if probability to select, uh, to respond to a specific item, it's relatively high, so the value of C would be more or less this similar to B, then it would mean that on one hand the item is not really difficult, but also can give a really very, uh, very skewed responses. It's not good for the overall measurement, right? Okay, hopefully you see the use of IRT in relation to adaptive testing. But of course, this IRT can be also used if non-adaptive testing is um, implemented. For instance, if you would like to select good items for the final version of your test, you can also use IRT in order to assess the quality or to prepare a very good test. Let's take into account different another type of information that can be obtained from IRT analysis. This is uh, ICC. This 
curve provides information about information. This is a curve that typically is expected when we analyze test scores. This IIC expresses whether a test score provides essential information about measured trait in a specific sample. So we calculate this information, or we can do it, for the whole test. Typically, you would assume that the average for the test score is around zero and the distribution is close to normal. This example is uh, close to ideal test output. If the distribution would be flat, it will basically indicate that a specific test or set of items does not provide specific knowledge about the trait, so does not measure well a specific trait, latent variable. Let's take a look at another example. On the left hand side you have IIC that it's not expected when analyzing the quality of an item because at this point this curve as you see it's flat it does not provide information about an item it does not provide essential information about the measured trait on the right hand side you have IIC that is expected when analyzing the quality of an item. In this case, the reversed U on curve suggests that this item provides essential information on the measured trait. Even though you have some uh, values in this case, it's not really important. What is important is the information as a whole. As you see, this reversed U informs that this specific item measures a trade well. We can also compare on one graph two types of IIC. This two types of IIC, reversed U and U, informs us about two different aspects. Reversed U, in this case, it's related to information and the U-curve illustrates a level of error. In this example, the test provides more information than error about individuals whose scores were between minus two and two. Why is that? Take a look at the extreme left part of, of the graph. As you see, if a specific person had really low level of this trait, then for this participant, error was stronger than the information. And the same on the other end. In this case, when participants of extreme high level of this trait were measured using this test, the error was higher than the information. Still, it's not a best outcome because in between you have relatively large group of participants and in this larger group of participants we had more information than the error. Let's take a look at examples. This output is uh, from JMetric. It's an example from one of my research. This test was used to identify children with attention deficits. We also found in this research, after calculating the scores, when we compared children with attention deficits with children without the attention deficits, we found that kids with attentional deficits were not able to correctly perform items 19, 20, 21, and so on. What does it tell us about the whole test? Let's take a look at difficulty levels. You may think if negative value occurs 
then it doesn't say good things about the whole test. It's not true. Because the way how we created this test, we assume that it should be relatively easy to correctly respond to item 1, 2, 3, and so on. That's the case. Values from minus 6 to uh, minus 0 0.19 indicate that the first part of the test was relatively easy. So the first part was not really sensitive to attentional uh, deficits. But the other parts, since the difficulty level becomes more extreme, more positive, were suggesting that the second part of the test was more and more difficult for kids. Later on, we also found when taking into account details that children with attentional deficits were not able, as I mentioned, to finish uh, items from 19 to the final one. Overall, we assess that this test is a nice test to differentiate between uh, children with uh, attentional deficits. Let's assume that similar approach you would like to apply in personal selection when assessing skills. You would assume that a part of the test should be relatively easy. So people will learn how to respond to uh, items, but then the difficulty level will gradually increase and only highly skilled participants or candidates will be able to perform the final part of the test. That statistics, if distributed more or less in this way, will indicate that the whole test has really good quality and can be used uh, in the future. Okay, that's one of the examples of using this test. Let's take into account Another example. In this example, we have results that shows you that we can calculate different types of reliability. It's the lower part of this graph. So we have reliability for items and reliability for persons. The first type in takes into account if we take into account quality of items. As you see, this reliability is very high. It means that we can use it for, for diagnosis. But we also have another information. And this information is reliability for persons. Here, the value for persons is substantially lower than the value for items. So, we may conclude that there is probably uh, a group of participants where the consistency in responses to specific items was different than the consistency in the other group of participants. Maybe there is a subgroup of participants that were not able to constantly resolve those uh, items. It means that there may be something incorrect with instruction to, uh, to the test, maybe something wrong with the items. Then what you could do, given this fact, you could for example try to think what kind of items could be deleted from the whole test. Maybe too easy items or maybe too difficult items. Once you do that, you can rerun your analysis and see to what extent that changes also reliability level. You would like to obtain similar and also high values for both, for items reliability and persons reliability. That would be perfect. If you do that, you can answer to the question, what's the main source of, uh, of the error? Is the items? or maybe individuals. If changes within the structure of the test are not really helpful, still you cannot 
increase availability for the person. So probably uh, it's not the problem with the test, but how typically um, participants respond uh, to the test. Still, it's to some extent less important than the quality of items. Okay, since we know how to apply those uh, sophisticated methods in personal selection, let's wait for Dan Asfar's cast lecture. Well, um, he will show you more examples of the use of IRT uh, in relation to HR processes. Now, as a final element, let's consider the following questions. Think for a second, what are the best practices in developing tests that can be used cross-culturally? Then, how can tests be shown to be equivalent across cultures when the sample size for some groups is small? And finally, how do cultural differences affect the validity of a test? Does differential to validity exist across cultures, countries or linguistic groups? Let's just discuss that in a QA session. Thank you for your attention.